Well, hello, Tobago, and happy Sabbath. What a privilege it is that I have the opportunity to share with you a third message regarding Christ, our righteousness, save our people. What a powerful theme you have selected. I want to wish you a beautiful and happy Sabbath, and we're going to jump right in to Galatians chapter 5. If you want to grab your Bible and open to Galatians 5, that's where we're going to be primarily working from. When my little girl Leah was maybe five or six years old, she came to me with a very unique request. She said, Daddy, would you give me some money so I can buy you a present? That is the essence of the gospel. You and I are helplessly dependent on God, on Christ, for all things that pertain to righteousness. When we give anything back to God, we are simply returning to him what he has first given to us. It is as if we are standing before the God of the universe and saying, Father, give us some righteousness as a gift so that we can render it back to you. There's no credit that we can take for the righteous deeds of our lives that flow from our hearts in response to the love of God revealed in Christ. Now, the Apostle Paul understood this very clearly. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, notice this language very carefully. Paul says, stand fast or firm, therefore in the liberty with which or by which Christ has made us free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Notice what the Apostle Paul is communicating here. Liberty, that is deliverance, that is salvation, has been achieved for us by Christ as an accomplished reality. It's not something that we manufacture. It's not something we even contribute to. We are not called upon to generate our own liberty. We're not called upon to create our liberty. We're called upon to stand fast in an already achieved liberty in Christ. Another version, the New International Version, renders the text a little more clearly. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Again, the idea is very clear here. You are free, so be free. In other words, experience in your life what is already an accomplished fact in the person of Christ. You and I are called upon to catch up, as it were, to the life that we see on display in the second Adam, our corporate head, Jesus Christ. Well, Paul goes on, and I want you to now come with me to chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 4, and he very explicitly tells us that there is a potential problem that we encounter as he has called us to stand fast in the achieved, accomplished liberty that we have in Christ. He says, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. Notice the word attempt. If you attempt to be justified by the law, well, Paul says that you automatically become estranged from Christ. You have fallen from grace. The scripture is clear here that the fastest way, the most effective way to do damage to your spiritual experience is to attempt to be justified by the works of the law. Well, the Apostle Paul goes on in verse 5 and he says, for or because we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, this term, righteousness by faith, occurs one time in Scripture, and this is the passage in which it occurs. 
That is not to say that this is the only place in the Bible where righteousness by faith is taught. The concept, the idea, is pervasive throughout Scripture from Genesis with the experience of Abraham straight through the Old Testament into the New all the way to the book of Revelation. It can be said without any exaggeration that righteousness by faith is the central theme of the scriptures. It is, in fact, the gospel. But here we have the term, the terminology, righteousness by faith. And I want you to notice something. Paul describes us, you and me and himself, as eagerly, eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. And he tells us that it is the Holy Spirit that is stimulating this desire in us to experience righteousness by faith. But then Paul explains how righteousness by faith works. He says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails or accomplishes anything but faith working through love. Now, circumcision was a controversial issue at the time of Paul. It was the topic that was being hotly debated at that time. So, you could literally put anything you want as a replacement for circumcision and uncircumcision, and the statement would remain true. For in Christ Jesus, neither, put whatever you want there, nor whatever you want, nothing avails for righteousness except one thing. What is the one thing, Paul says, that actually does avail or accomplishes what needs to be accomplished? Well, it is faith that works by love. Let's unpack this for a moment. The word working here is the Greek word energio, from which we get the English word energy or energize. Paul literally says that we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, faith that is energized by love. The powerful energizing force of the gospel, according to the Apostle Paul, is the love of God. So we can break it down like this. Paul says that righteousness is only achievable by faith. Well, you remember what he said in contrast to this. He says righteousness is not achievable by the works of the law. And he says, in fact, that you will do damage to your spiritual experience if you attempt, that's the word he used, attempt to be justified by the law. Righteousness, he says, is only by faith. It's not as if righteousness can be achieved by any one of a few or many different mechanisms. No, Paul says that righteousness is only achieved by faith. But then, this is the key idea for Paul. Righteousness is only achieved by faith, and faith is energized by vital contact with the love of God. The moment the love of God revealed in Christ is introduced into my mind, my heart, my life, I become energized, I become empowered by his love to begin exercising faith by which righteousness is actually achieved. On one occasion, Ellen White received a letter. And in this letter, somebody asked her, what is the message of righteousness by faith? It's a good question. Would you like to know the answer? Ellen White didn't give a long, drawn-out, theological answer. She didn't give an academic answer. She gave a very practical answer. In response to the question, what is the message of righteousness by faith, Ellen White said, it is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit. 
Let me just repeat that. Let it register upon your mind and reach deep down into your heart. In response to the question, what is the message of righteousness by faith? Ellen White responded, it is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit. Notice that she says that love is an active principle. Love cannot remain inactive. We know this. When you love someone, you are energized to act in their favor, to their benefit, for their blessing and well-being. Righteousness by faith is nothing more, nothing less than the profound reality of the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit. So, Paul is warning us in Galatians, specifically in Galatians chapter 5, when he says that if you attempt to be justified by the works of the law, well, you're going to be estranged from Christ, cut off from Christ, separated from Christ. Because every effort made to be justified by works sets in motion a cycle, a diabolical, damaging, destructive cycle of shame, which we try to deal with by works of the law, by obedience to the law, by whatever means it is that we imagine we can earn and merit and appease God. Listen, but when we, by shame, attempt to obey the law of God, shame being the motivation, listen, this results inevitably in failure. And then that failure reinforces the shame. This is a reinforcing cycle. This is a deep, deep, dark hole into which you and I will sink if, according to Paul, we attempt to be saved by our works, to earn God's favor by our works, to appease God's anger by our deeds. It is a cycle of defeat, and it is a reinforcing cycle that causes damage not only to our own souls, but to our family members to our fellow church members, to anybody with whom we have contact. But Paul explains to us that legalism, listen you guys, legalism is simply behavioral compliance, outward compliance, rendered under a sense of obligation for fear of punishment or hope of reward. In other words, the motivation here is self-centered. It's not centered on Christ. It's not centered on God. It's not centered on God's glory and pleasure and happiness. It is centered on getting me out of trouble and securing for me the rewards of eternal life and the new heavens and the new earth. Legalism is a problem at the level of my motivation. What's driving me? Martin Luther got to the heart of this in his own experience when he says, what would you do? This is a hypothetical experiment, if you will, that Luther is asking us to engage in. It's a hypothetical question. You can answer it right now in the privacy of your own mind and heart. What would you do if there was no law to command or forbid anything? It's a pretty deep question. What would you do if there was no law to command or forbid anything? Well, Luther says that the only obedience to the law that is really acceptable is obedience that arises from the bottom of the heart with pleasure, not from fear of punishment or hope of reward. Notice the language again here. Not from fear of punishment or hope of reward. 
So if the fear of punishment, the hope of reward, if those are not the motivations that drive the Christian experience, what is the motivation? Well, Paul told us in Galatians chapter 5. The energizing, empowering force of the gospel is the love of God manifested in Christ. And so the shame works, failure, shame cycle is replaced with a cycle of innocence and love and victory that reinforces our sense of innocence. This is the beautiful upward spiraling cycle that we are invited into by the gospel of Christ. But then Paul keeps can, goes on and he continues to expound his point coming la- later now to the end, toward the end of Galatians 5. Notice this. I say then, Paul is speaking to you and me in chapter 5 verse 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you and I motivated, energized, empowered by the love of God revealed in Christ, walk in the Spirit. Well, we will experience victory in our lives and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's a promise, notice the language, not a requirement. Did you catch that? Notice the words again. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It's God promising that he will do something for you and for me. It's not God saying, you need to get your act together, but God saying, stand fast in the liberty, the salvation, with which I have saved you and set you free. It's a promise. The gospel is God making promises to us. Not us making promises to God. In the book Steps to Christ, Ellen White describes our promises to God. And she says that our promises to God are like ropes of sand. In other words, you will never be able to grasp hold of a rope of sand and elevate yourself. Jesus said, which one of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature, to his height? Well, the obviously implied answer is no one can. And then Jesus followed up by saying, neither can you who are accustomed to doing evil do good. Jesus is telling us that we are morally bankrupt. There is literally nothing in me, nothing in you that can manufacture righteousness. And so the Apostle Paul says the only way righteousness is going to manifest in your life and mine is when we tap in by faith to the love of God revealed in the person of Christ. It's all about God making promises and fulfilling them to us. And then in verse 17, Paul says, for the flesh lusts or wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Now notice the language. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. There's a battle going on inside of the human being, inside of you, inside of me. There is what we might call an internal civil war between the flesh and the spirit. But Paul's point is this, that if we, in an experience of righteousness by faith, energized or empowered by love, walk in the Spirit, well, guess what? We will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We will walk in the truth and righteousness of Christ, not because it is in us to do so, but because it is in the love of God to so transform us that it becomes not only possible, but it becomes the desire of our heart. It is the difference between I want to versus I have to. One is a 
positive orientation. The other is a negative orientation. When you want to do something, you tend to do it. But when you feel obligated or duty-bound under threat of punishment or hope of reward, well, then you are most likely going to fail in your endeavor. So Paul goes on and he makes this profound statement. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And here is an ingenious line. Against such there is no law. There is no law against love. There is no law against peace. There is no law against joy. There is no law against long-suffering or kindness or goodness or faithfulness or gentleness or self-control. When we walk in the spirit of righteousness by faith that works by love, well, the fruits of the Spirit begin to manifest in our lives and there is no law that stands against those things. Verses 24 and 25 of Galatians 5, Paul says, and those who are Christ's, that is, those who belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Again, Paul is leading us into an understanding of righteousness by faith. If you stand free in Christ, you will walk free in or with Christ. Are you tracking with Paul's reasoning? If you stand free in the achievements of Christ, apart from any contribution that you and I can make to what Jesus has done for us. If you and I tap into the freedom, the deliverance, the liberty, the salvation that we already have as a free gift in Christ, well, it will change us. At the deepest level of our hearts and minds, it will change us. So we come back to what my daughter said to me when she was five or six years old. One of the most beautiful things I've ever heard from one of my children. Daddy, can you give me some money so I can buy you a present? Why don't we adopt that posture before God, before Christ, our righteousness? Why don't we adopt a posture in which we realize that we are free and that salvation is free, so that we can be free, so that we can experience the freedom that is only available in Christ. I invite you, in fact, I urge you, in the name of Christ, who is our righteousness, that you and I would, as Paul says in Galatians 5, that we would eagerly, anticipate righteousness by faith that works by the love of God. Would you pray with me right now that we would experience the beauty and power of the gospel as Paul has described it in Galatians chapter 5? Father in heaven, we so appreciate the fact that you have done so much for us in Christ before we have done anything at all to deserve the free gift of your righteousness through him. Father, we right now pause to believe in the message of righteousness by faith that works by love. Father, when, when Paul describes the gospel, he doesn't simply call us to do something. No, he points to what Christ has done for us, apart from any contribution we could make. And then he invites us to stand fast in the liberty with which Christ has set us free. May we do that, Father. May we stand 
firm and fast and eternal in the freedom that you have purchased for us at great cost to yourself in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.